Good evening and welcome to Plain Talk. My name is Christopher Ram. Thank you for joining me. Um, and I hope you will stay with us for the next hour as we discuss one of Guyana's many challenges. Now, if you probably ask the average person, how's life? You get a litany of complaints. You ask the business people, the most optimistic ones tell you it could have been worse. The average one tells you, well, you know, things are really slow. But do we really put ourselves in the position of persons who really have challenges in life? Do we understand what it is to not have enough money to send your three children to school and therefore you have to rotate them. One goes on one day, Monday, one goes on Tuesdays, and one goes on Wednesday. Do we understand the challenges facing the sick person who cannot get the medication that they so much need? Or the person who can't find a job, the sugar worker, who is made redundant, put on the bread line, with very little hope of finding a job. Do we understand the challenges that face persons, mothers, particularly single parents, who may have a kid or two with learning or other disability? Do we understand the challenges of a person who has a physical disability, who is unable to walk and to do the things that we take for granted? And do we understand what it is maybe to be blind, to be deaf, to be dumb, to have a serious terminal illness. Tonight we'll try to answer one of those questions. The one dealing with persons with visual disability. We call it blind. Some persons say it's not politically correct to do so. Well, I've got somebody this evening to talk with me. who is the president of the Guyana Society for the Blind, an organization that has been around for over 63 years. My guest this evening is Mr. Cecil Morris, president of the Guyana Society for the Blind. Mr. Morris, thank you very much for coming on Blind Dog. Thank you very much for having me, Mr. Ram. Yes. And, you know, I just want to say to the listeners out there that you know it's a pleasure to be here and to get a point of view across. I hope when the program is finished, at least we will, you know, get a better understanding. Persons out there will get a better understanding of. You know, some of the problems that persons with disability might have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. The, the challenges facing visually impaired people, um, and by the way, what's the, I know it's, it's sometimes said the, the politically correct word is, is visually impaired and not to say blind. What is the policy of the Guyana Society for the Blind? in respect of this description? Well, the Ghana Society for the Blind really feels that whether you call it a physical, not a physical, a visual, a visual impairment. impairment, whether you call it, um, you know, I have low vision or whatever you call it, the bottom line is that you're blind. Because once you lose a certain amount of your sight, you're legally blind. Yes. The hospital will tell you that, the doctors will tell you that, that you're legally blind. Um, you find in Guyana, 
that some people just have a light perception. You know, they could tell when a light is on or when it's off. Yes. And they will tell you that I see. But when you question them and you ask them, what is it that you would see? They can't really tell you anything. You mm -hmm. know, but it's just because you don't want people to, you know, to, to, to say to you that, well, you're blind or you don't want to accept blindness. So you, you find all kinds of fancy names to call it. I tell them, I tell anybody that talk to me and, you know, when people tell me about you're visually impaired and all of that, I say, no, that's just cosmetic. That don't make me feel better, right? I am blind. It's a situation that I have to face up to, you know, that I am blind. I'm not seeing I'm blind and I have to live with that. So you could call it whatever name you want, but the fact of the matter is that I am blind, you know, and I, I face up to that. And, you know, we, we try to tell people, don't try and hide the situation. It's not a situation for you to hide. It's a situation to you, for you to come to grips with and understand that, well, I am blind. I have to change the way that I used to live because I used to see, I could drive a car, could ride a bicycle down the road. No. Probably could still drive a car, but I might kill a lot of people. So I don't drive. You a don't car. want you to do that, <laughs> right? You know, so I don't want to do that. So I, I, you know, I'm blind. I have to, you know, live accordingly to suit the the situation that I'm you, in. You adapt to the environment. Now, how grave, you know, for us who who consider ourselves normal. Yeah. Um, Cannot, we, we can never experience, we don't know. I mean, you shut your eyes and you try to walk out of this room. What's it like for you? Well, let me, give you, let me back up a little bit. Sure. I, I started losing my sight when I was three and a half years old. I grew with an aunt and an uncle and they discovered that I was, you know, bringing objects close to my eyes to see. Yes. Things like that. So they took me to the hospital. When I went to the hospital, you know, there was a doctor there by the name of Dr. Maury. And he did about three operations on my left eye. I think it's about the third operation when he did something wrong and he recognized that he spoiled the eye. But he did not say anything to my parents about that. Uh -huh. You know, he just continued stringing them along. Then the right eye started to go. Now the right eye started to go because he did not do what he was supposed to do. And what he was supposed to do is remove the left eye because the left eye the damage that he did to the left eye wouldn't, couldn't be corrected. And if he keep the left eye there, it would start drying on the right. And uh -huh. that's what happened. So when I was about to do my last operation, which would have been the eighth operation. And I, that was at what age? I was about nine years old. Okay, so from three and a half to yeah. nine years. Is in and out of hospital, treatment after treatment. Um, my aunt met a lady from Suriname and she said, you know, they got very good eye doctors and she decided, because I went into hospital, the Jarson Hospital, to do the, the, the last operation. And I got extremely sick the day before the operation because probably then I realized what I was really going through. I take it on, I got very sick and, you know, they send me out to hospital, tell my aunt to bail me up and come back. But she never did carry me back, she carried me to Suriname instead. And then the doctors go through the records because we walk with some records. Yes. And the doctors say, this guy could have one eye and do anything, almost anything. But because the doctors did not say to you all and did not do what he was supposed to do, which was removing the eye, he's carrying this eye. I, at that point in time, I was nine years old and I am like listening to the doctor and the doctor saying to my aunt, we are going to save the sight in this right eye for a while. But this guy is going to go blind. You know, somewhere down the line he's going to go blind. So they went through the, the, the thing. They disconnected what they had connection from the right to the left. Do the disconnection. All of that killed the eye dead completely. And I had fair amount of sight from about uh, 9, 10, you know, up to about 16 years old. I could really see to walk around, do, you know, almost anything. Um, in the night, I had problems, so that was, was you know, a, a kind of handicap. To what was the nature of the problem in the nights? <laughs> I could only see the lights. Can't see anything else. Okay. If, if I'm on the road, I would see a car light or a bicycle light. 
but what is on the the the, 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 the light is on yes i really don't make make it out so i used to really keep to myself i was fortunate i had some young friends with myself you know boys that we grew up together and i don't think they they really realized what was the the troubles that i had so whatever they were doing they would tag me along so i had a normal life as 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 a, a youngster but at the age of 16 i my I started losing my sight and when i started losing my sight i realized to myself that it was losing but didn't want to face up there so but a year i would see like two days i would wake up one morning and the place would look foggy foggy i am not seeing anything and my aunt was an encourager she would say what happened to you today i said i'm feeling too well yeah, she would lie down and rest but i never would tell her why i'm lying down and resting sure. uh-huh. <laughs> anyhow um i think when we got independence in 1966 that was a day that i could never forget i was outside on the um church street and mr hamilton green minister at the time and his wife was in this band board of a nation and they were coming down and they stopped because there was a bottleneck right in front where i was standing and i'm looking at all these costumes and in that split second of looking at all these costumes yeah. everything turned like in one wow you know you've seen all the different colors but you can't differentiate what is what i was with some friends and I didn't say anything. I just stand up and so on. When the the parade was over, the guys we will you know left and went home. And those guys, how did you get home? Well, this was saying the guys that I was with make certain when we go anywhere, they would make certain that they will pass by me and drop me to my gap. Okay. And I am. This fine. was with bicycle. Car? No, no, we would walk. Sometimes it with bicycle, but in this case we were walking. I was living in Charles Street, not far from where we were. Um, I spent about four days in my, in my bed not seeing anything. Did you tell your aunt? No, I didn't. I didn't tell her anything. Um, Do you regret not having told no, her? No, I didn't regret. Said. I know why I didn't not tell her. Tell it. Okay, okay. Because I know how she would have, you know, taken it and so on. Anyhow, um, four days after I got back some sight and I realized the sight that I got back was much more limited than what I had before. It was really limited. So I didn't really make a fuss about that, but a month after it went, and um, when it went, I I didn't say anything. I had these guys, as I say, and I used to move around with them, and they would carry me up. I had a f- particular friend; he's in the states now, and we were on the sea wall by this swimming pool, the Loku pool. Mm-hmm. And normally, when we go there, he would tow me, so I would hold on on the bike and run and jump on on the carrier the bike, and he decided. I don't know what happened today, but he just pushed off the bike and said, come on, let me go. But I couldn't see the bike, so I couldn't run and catch the bike. And then when he realized that I wasn't running behind him, he stopped. And he said, what to you? I said, nothing. And I walked in to take the bike. And he looking at me, and when I make to snatch the bike, he moved away the bike. Oh, shocks. So when he moved away the bike, no, I, have, well, I continue walking. And I walk and I jam the bike because he stopped. So we ride and we come down to Cam Street and normally you would sit on the bike while I sit on the wall and we would line for the rest of the Sunday afternoon line. And this particular day he go and put on the bike, I said, Lord, once he go and put on the bike, he realized what happened. He coming back for cross question me. So he come back, he said, You ain't seen? I said, No. He said, When it happened just now? I said, No, man. I said, But two weeks ago it happened. Yeah. And he said, Two weeks ago? We were in the National Park, we were in the National Park rowing. You didn't mm-hmm. see it? I said, no. He said, we've been in the cinema last night. We went and see a Wang Yu picture. Wang Yu get blind in that picture. Oh, Wang Yu get blind, the guys in the cinema are saying, look down blind people in China throwing dart and all kind of thing. Them blind people in Guyana's neck rope mat and basket. And I'm like smiling to myself because <laughs> I have not seen it. And he keep questioning me. He said, why you didn't tell your aunt? I said, bye. Me and don't break up on this. I don't really want that to happen. I go through that with what four four weeks. And on the fourth week, I made a blunder and my aunt pick it up. And when she pick it up, I try for the next fifteen minutes to do things to prove to her that I that will see. Yeah, yeah. Right? 
but she just keeps standing and looking at me. The last thing I do, I take out a bottle of water from the fridge, throw some water in the glass, drink the water, go back to the pipe, fold the bottle, put it back in the fridge. And when I turn, and I go for a turn away, she said, come. She said, you're not seeing. I said, no. She said, how long? I said, about six weeks now. She said, what? They had a bench in the kitchen. She dropped on the bench and she started crying. I go and I go up and I said, man, you know that the doctor said that this is what is going to happen. What's going to happen, yeah. Right? Don't, don't think of it. She said, anyway, Monday morning, bright and early, we go into the public hospital. I said, but it didn't make no sense. She said, we going. We go to the hospital. Fortunately or unfortunately, we sit down there for three hours. We didn't see no doctor. And she get fed up and she said, let me go home back. To date, anytime I go back to the hospital, let's go by myself. <laughs> Because, you know, she, I don't think she could face carrying me back <clears throat> to the thing. Every so often I would go and take her eye check up and so on. But I was determined from then and even before. Because when I used to go and kick football and I come back, she would say, you're going to strain your eye kicking football. It's hell when you get blind and you're going to sit on a car now and people going to do you anything. And I said, me? Nobody ain't going to do me nothing. Because I am not going to depend on nobody for nothing. And that's what I used to say to myself. And, you know, to cut a long story short, I got married when I was about 25, right? I had three kids. I never one day had to go, and I thank God for that, to beg anybody for anything for my kids. How did you sustain the family? When I got my first child, I was at the institute. We had some problems at the institute. So you had gone into the... Yeah, I was working at the institute at the time. Doing, institute. Yeah, doing handicraft work. I, we had some problems, and I... At night, I get up, and I said, you see me, I ain't able with this. I got a child. I got a young child mother. I got to look after to this child, and I got to look after to the mother also. That's my responsibility. And I walking up and down in the house the night studying what I'm going to do. My aunt gets about five o'clock in the morning. She said, whole night I hear you walking up and down. You say, whole night or what? What the hell are you walking up and down whole night for? I said, mom, I got a problem. She said, what is it? I said, I want to do something. I want to earn some real money. She said, buy what you can do. And I said, you know the land that we got on the highway? She said, yeah. I said, I want to go on the land. I want to mine some chickens. The fortunate thing about my aunt and my uncle, if I tell them I want to go on the moon, they facilitate you. They say never, they would never say to me, what's the is you talking about you want to go on the moon? They just ask me, how you intend, intend getting there? And when I tell them how I intend getting there, they would say to me, I think there's a good route. You should try this other route. And that was the kind of upbringing that I had from the people. So when I tell her that, she said, you really want to go? How you going to make out on the highway? I said, carry my child, mother, my child with me. They said, okay. That was November. The 4th of January, after New Year's Day, the 4th of January, you know, my aunt and my uncle packed me up. We go in Albaistan because my child mother used to live in Albaistan, picked she up with the child, and we went on the highway. My aunt carried me up. We had some food stuff. They packed away the place. They do everything because we had an, a little country house there. Mm -hmm. And they left and they come back to town. My uncle come up the weekend. We go to the, the, the bush at the back, cut some wood, start building the fold pen, because I start, decided I can start mining chickens. And until, what, the recession, after the border mirror, I was mining chickens. And when I finished, when I stopped mining chickens, I used to turn like 2,000 chickens every two weeks. What sort of, what, what the sisters like, you had? Me, my child mother, my aunt and my uncle when they come up on weekends. Wow. Right? Um, as I always remember this incident, I was fulling water for us to do some plucking. And a guy came and was talking to my uncle and he said to him, You sure this boy don't see or is smart this boy this place smart? So my uncle said, Why you would want to play smart? Because he didn't want to work hard. My uncle said, Well, there's 120 buckets of water. He got to fetch up for full them drums so we could pluck them chicken tomorrow. I don't know if this not working hard. You, know, there's you a used to fetch city. 120 buckets yeah, of water. Yeah, I fetch it up from the creek. We live about a uh, hundred yards away from the creek, and I would go down to the creek, dip water, come up, and you know, fetch it. When 
I didn't have all this size, so it was quite bony at the time. It was because of doing them kind of work. Uh-huh. Not to put us outside. But <laughs> I was the first money that I got from the chicken because it was 200 chickens I mined for. Us. When I took that money and I came down to town to do some shopping because I didn't come down for a long time. My aunt and uncle would come up weekends and yeah. bring it. I gave my child mother, I think it was $200. I gave her, I said, this is your money. Go and buy wherever you want. And I feel so big, Mr. Ram. I feel so big that I could have done that, you know. When I stopped mining chickens, I had the contraband flower thing was in. I used to go up in the Crabwood Creek and buy flower come from. Well, how you used to do this, man? <laughs> the, 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 what must say, the art of doing anything as a blind person. Mm-hmm. The first thing is that you have to accept what is your position. You accept blindness. And once you accept it, you know that you have to move on, right? Any person with a disability, and don't accept the disability, they're in trouble, big trouble. Lots of persons that I know that la- start losing their sight, and they start uh, taking it on. They get crazy, they get, they, they, get, they get nervous breakdown. So you're suggesting one of the first things you should do is accept it and, and adapt. Right. Do, once, you, do you have a, do, sorry go on once you do that the rest of the, the journey is an easy journey so are you saying that you have an easy journey yes yes because I would say I have an easy journey I mean it was challenging to do the things that I did but today I could as I say throw back and look back at them things and I tell people I would never be a miserable old man there was too many good things that happened in my life that I could reflect on, you know. I don't listen to the news. I listen to news occasionally because when I listen to news, it just depresses me. When I see junkies on the road doing the foolishness they're doing, it just depresses me. So I try to keep a distance between things what will depress me, you know. I had that my first marriage broke up. And when it, when it went to pieces, I went to pieces also. But I rebound from it and I got married a second time. My second marriage broke up and it wasn't such a, a, a rough thing like, like the first. But today I am still happy. I have three kids. I have 12 grandchildren. And, you know, my kids and me, we're like, uh, they, they, they mother, they, they, my first wife, does always say to them, you are very disrespectful to your father. They're not disrespectful to me. They treat me like an equal. Mm-hmm. You know, they treat me like an equal. And and she used to do the same thing. She used to treat me like an equal. She never used to treat me like like I'm blind. I'm or or anything happened to me. When I tell she, you're not gonna fetch you water. She said me, I can go down with you and help you fetch a couple bucket. But you gotta fetch the rest. Me, I have to do everything. And that is the you know the kind of life that I had with my aunt and my uncle. They always would assist me but they would never decide to take over what I am doing in full and do it for me. No way. And I like that. And I'm saying to people, right, even in Guyana, I'm saying to normal people, life is all about what you make it. And if you just decide to sit down and put your hands up in the air, nobody going to pay you no mind. But if they see you doing something, they're going to assist you to do it. And that is the key for me. Mr. Morris, um, you you don't have regrets, do you? About being blind? Yes. No. I I get into this this that kind of discussion. Up to today, I was in a taxi and I was telling a guy, I firmly believe God blind me. And the man said, Mommy, you can't say that. And I'm saying to him, Yeah, I believe that. I believe God blind me because if God didn't blind me, right? Who knows what I would have been. Right? I probably I probably would have been locked away some way, you know, languishing at the government's expense or something. But you know <laughs> I the, see you also have a sense of humor. Yeah, no, I you see, this is how I look at it. Um there's a funny part of life and there's a serious part of life. And you know, when I when I look at some of the guys that I grew up with, right? I grew up with these guys, and when I look at them, 
one of them, Mondi, he was at the institute. He's losing his sight also. When he came to the society, and I was talking to him, he said, you want to join the society because he's losing his sight and blah, blah, blah. So I turned to him and he said, how was your brother? He said, my brother? I said, yes, Paul. He said, wait, you know me? And I said to him, yes, I know you. We grew up in Charlotte Street together. Mm -hmm. Right? I said, why you don't know me? Because the name I'm carrying now is not the name that you wouldn't know me by. Uh -huh. And Mondi was telling me, he said, man, I, me is the same age. He said, man, I'm getting old, you know. I said, why you say that? He said, because I'm getting slow. Because it's not coming to grips with what is happening. Yeah, yeah. And I said to him, I started to laugh. He said, man, how you could laugh? I said, by all, we're getting old and all, we're getting slow. <laughs> right? But it's just that he's not coming to grips with it. And that's what I'm saying to people. You have to force come to grips with what is, before, you know, coming for you. And when, it, when you, 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 you accept that, you could move on. The rest of the life is easy. Let me ask you this. You said you became visually impaired yeah. at that state from yeah. about three and a half. Yeah. Um, and you really became blind around yeah. 16. Yeah. So it's been several decades now. Right. Um, if you compare, if you can recall, mm -hmm. society's tolerance for persons with impairment in the days of the, you, you mentioned independence. Yeah. It means you were born around 50, 1950. 51. Yes. Right. Now, was society more tolerant of persons with disability then than it is now? Yes, I would say that they were more tolerant then. I would say they were more tolerant then. How, how is the intolerance of, of today's era manifesting itself? How do people treat persons with disabilities? Well, it, it goes from, you know, from different as, aspects. Um, the first thing that used to strike me about this, this situation is when you go stand on the road and you stop a bus. And the bus stop and the man realizes that you're blind and he drive away. Mm. You know, um, taxis pull up for you who going with you? Nobody. And they would say, nah, me carrying you. I ain't carrying you alone. Because you blind. You ain't no way. Um, people that sells on the road, the, the, the city council, and I want to talk about the city council here. Go on, please feel free. If you look at Regent Street, the city planners should really be shamed of how Regent Street and the pavements are. Even to normal people have problems walking down them pavement. Mm -hmm. So much less me that blind. Them manholes that don't have no cover. Yeah. You know, those are some simple, simple basic things. You go to the hospital, right? And people believe that you turn up at the hospital with nobody because you're either crazy or I don't know. Right? It's not that you don't want you want to go to the hospital by yourself. Sometimes you don't have somebody. People have things to do, so you have to go to the hospital and you go by yourself. And people say, "Why you didn't come with somebody?" Right? It's not that you couldn't you you didn't get nobody to come with. Who would these what, people be? Workers at the hospital, um, members of the public, you know, mm -hmm. them kind of thing. People would jam you on the road. You're walking on the road and you you know they would walk into you and say, But well, what would you mind you ain't seeing? You got why why you on the road? You shouldn't even be on the road. And them kind of things. Are you suggesting, are you suggesting, Mr. Morris, that that attitude did not prevail then? It did, but not as much and not as aggressive as it is right now. Not as it is aggressive, you know. People people today are much more aggressive towards disabled people on the road than, you know, I would say in the 60s and the 70s and even up to the 80s. In terms of facilities, now, the, the Ghana Society for the Blind was established sometime in 1955. Um, 1951, it, it started 1950, 51, 56, 
it was um, that was the let's go at the time. Uh -huh. It was enacted in the formally. Let's go. Yeah. Okay. I see. Um, at the time, the, the the kind of facilities that the state provided. Um, how, what was it like? From what you might have heard people talk, mm -hmm. your predecessors, your president. Yeah. So you probably have access to some of the records. Yeah, yeah. And so on. What, what, were the facilities like then, compared with what they are now? Comparing them then and now, now it's far better, mm -hmm. because I think technology has taken us, you know, a step level. But the point about it is that the persons that used to deal with, with, with the persons with disability used to do it because they think probably if I'm kind to this individual or so on, I'm going to get a good place when I go up to heaven, when I die, and that kind of thing. They weren't serious, although they had things in place, they weren't serious with the things that they had in place. You're talking about then? Then, yeah. Mm -hmm. They weren't serious about it. Like you had an institute, and I remember when I joined the society in 1967, 68, the first annual general meeting I had, I get up and I, um, that I was at, as a youngster, and I went into the district, and I was one of the youngest persons there. I get up and I ask them, you know, the, 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 the powers that be, what is the plan for the society for the next five years? And they basically, <laughs> they basically knock me down, you know. We want to put the plans in the next five years. You should be satisfied with what is happening right now. Because of that, and because of that kind of situation, you find that coming down to the 70s and the 80s, you had a struggle to keep up to date because by then, the Ghana Society for the Blind was part of the Caribbean Society, um, the Caribbean Council for the, for the Blind, where all the organizations in the Caribbean you know, was, was linked together. And when you go to the meetings, you realize that we were really and truly very, very far behind. So you need to bring the, 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 the thing up. And we had a serious, you know, getting that off the ground. I would say we tried, you know, up to about, what, 2006, 2008. And then we started getting moving that, you know, this is, the situation changed and people start looking seriously at plans for the blind. Now, um, the, what facilities you have now, this, the Ghana Society for the Blind, what building, what type of facility, um, what, what resources are available? We, the building that we have, it is when the building was built, the first building was built in 1962, um, year, you know, like in 1986, there was an, a next building added on to that. So the, let us say the building doubled in size from then mm -hmm. to now, right? We had several, you know, um, refurbishing of the building over the years. The facility that we have now is not of the best. It could be far better, you know, if, if the resources was available. But, you know, we, as we do in Guyana, we make do with whatever we have, and we try to get the best out of it. Well, where do you get your resources from? How, um, how, let me ask you, how many people are, are permanent residents of, the, of the, the facility? There is no permanent residence of this, 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 the facility, because the facility is not made for persons living. There are a couple of us that used to come from far out the town, like myself, that used to come from the high mm -hmm. that make, you know, make do with what is there. And we did that because of security reasons. We couldn't pay a security to keep the building, and people would break in the building and carry a lot of stuff for us. Um, I think it was 2002 or 2003 when they stole about approximately three million dollars <coughs> worth of equipment from the society and it was equipment that they couldn't do anything with because it was brailers mm -hmm. you know they couldn't really do anything with it 
um, we had like tape recorders and things like that. And since then, we decided that a couple of us. So there are no residents. There are no residents, but a couple of us do so stay there. What what happen? What happens? Wh what takes place at the building then? Well, because you said the building has double in capacity. Yeah. What 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 activities take place? Well, we have a school that we take in um, young persons that are visually impaired, as they say, or blind. Um, we even added some physical persons phys with physical disability to that school. Um, I think this is the fourth fourth year. Yeah, this would be the fourth. No, this would be the fifth or the sixth year that we're running that school. Um, and we can see at a CXC level, we do five subjects, and out of those five subjects, we have a 80 percent passes with the, the courses that we have. Mm -hmm. um, Who are the teachers? Well, we started with a Jamaican girl that was um, connected to the Blind Society in Jamaica. We started with two girls that was at the University of Guyana and Ganesh Singh, Mr. Singh that was to be here. We started with them. They have since moved on. Ganesh is still there. One of the girls that did... So Ganesh is one of the, the teachers? teachers? Yes, he is. Um, what role do you play in the school? <laughs> <laughs> I just... The role that I play is just to go in and talk to them, give them a pep talk and things like that. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, in, in, in case of... Like we talk about the history of the society or even the history of George, no? Mm -hmm. I would go and talk about that and things like that. Um, one of the girls that did the first set of CXC classes that we had, Rosie Ramit, right? She went on from doing our CXC and getting five ones. That was the first year that we sat the exam. And she went on to the teacher's training college, came out very successful she's now at the university and she's teaching also she do teach with you know she's a teacher be a teacher by the government by the government and she also teaches at the society for the blind and she teaches some class from time to time we will have volunteers coming in and doing their bit with the, with the students but you know the, the the bulk of the work is done by rosie and ganesh how do you manage to how does the society pay for these things? Well, the Ministry of Education uh, pays the teachers whatever the teachers have to be paid. You know, we, we get a small grant from them for paying teachers. They help us with some books. They, they, also they don't, do they pay the teachers or they give you a grant and out of No, that? They, they pay the teachers. They, they pay, pay the, the teachers, teachers, yes. Right. Um, they, give us s certain concessions when it comes to exams and things like that and you know they're very very supportive in terms of when the, ch the children have to sit the exams because they have to do it with the computer and the jazz program and all of that mm -hmm. they, they they're very you know they're very helpful in facilitating people to come and look at the computers make certain that the computers are clean and all the rest of it and that is it. <laughs> yeah, so um, you're the president. Yeah. How much does it cost to run the institute, approximately? I would say approximately it would cost to run the institute and run it in a proper way. It might cost about $100,000 a month. That's all? Yeah, that is what it would cost. And uh, but how we, much... Sorry, go on. But we don't get i think half of that amount to really run the society so the, the society you, you said the government helps how yeah. much does the government give the government give us a subvention of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars every year a year uh, yeah um that's twenty thousand dollars a month yeah um when you think about what they no, pay the no, teacher government i hope <laughs> the minister of education the minister of social protection i hope the vice presidents are listening your government gives the Ghana Society for the Blind $20,000 per month. Shame on you. Yeah. The, 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 when you would factor in the, the, the pain of the teachers 
and things like that, it might come up to a little more than that. But I really wouldn't have the figures off of the top of my head to add that to it. But that is the subvention that um, we're getting for ooh, the longest while. Does the medical profession um, come in periodically? And periodically, every second Wednesday, we have um, a clinic from the Ministry of Health that comes down and do blood pressure and sugar tests and give you medication and things like that. And what about the private sector? Well, the private sector is very helpful to us. Um, I think without the private well, sector... Well, you say very helpful, but you say you, you, know, you need 100000 a month, but you yeah. can't, you can't <laughs> yeah, raise it. You can't raise it. Our um, entire private sector can't help with $100,000 a month. There are certain companies that we have deeds of covenants with, and they will give us, you know, approximately a hundred thousand dollars every year. Um, every year, um, I can call Goldfield. Um, That's eight thousand dollars a month. Yeah, Goldfield give us about four hundred thousand. And, and they get it as a tax deductibility because it's a yeah. it's a deed of covenant. Yeah, 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 yeah. We have people that. Um, organizations that there was abroad that will make donations of equipment and things like that. When the one laptop for family came on stream, uh, Mr. Jagu was quite kind to, to really give us that kind of, of opportunity that we could have gotten a laptop for like a hundred blind and disabled persons. Yes. And we could have gone, you know, started this whole process of, of, of schooling and, and teaching people by using the laptop and things like that. Um, so all in all, you know, it, it, it is not as bad as it used to be. Um, but it's ago, not good. But it's not good. Well, right? let me ask you this. Now, we talk about the Blind Institute, yeah. where you can have some kind of training. Yeah. But what about the entire country? Ghana is a big country. What happens to the blind kid? Mm -hmm or the blind adult who lives outside of this catchment area? Well, there is a unit um, for blind children in the uh, Wisma Hill um, government school. There is also another unit in the Georgetown area in Albert Street. Um, when you say a unit, what, what happens there? Well, these, the children from kindergarten age would start going to that unit and then when they start doing like um, common entrance and they'll, when they pass to go to um, Would you like some water? Yes, yes. Yeah, mm. when, Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, go, uh, when they start going to the, the public schools, are. the government schools. Just like, uh, thank you. Yeah, when they, start, when they start going to the schools, you have itinerant teachers that will go to the school and visit them, make certain that they're doing the the kind of work that they're supposed to do with the normal kids, what the normal kids are doing. And so they would sit common entrance, then they will go on to secondary school. Um, what we find, and this is why we started the program with the Society for the Blind, the blind child might take a little longer to develop than the normal child because of the, the facilities not being available. And because of that, by the time they are ready to sit the exams, it's time when they should be out of, long out of school. Yes. So because of that, this is why we started the program, so that we will pick up that slack and, and you know, train the children and things like that. And it's been quite successful, as I say. We have an 80% pass mark. How long um, have you been president of the Art Institute? Um, I was president from... 1997 to 2002. I went abroad for a couple of years and I came back in 1994 and I was president from, I got back to presidency from <coughs> 2004, 2005, 2005 yes, yes. to now. Um, so yeah, what kind of engagement have you had with the government, has the, the directors of the Blind Institute, um, what kind of ex engagements did you have in terms of formulating and executing a policy 
that is blind friendly? Well, we've been trying to do that for years. Um, I think every minister that that would have served in the capacity where, where we had to make contact with, like Minister of Health, Minister of Education, Minister of um, Social Services, we have had meetings with all those ministers. Um, every time we have a meeting, I would say that we move a little closer to what we would want it to be. But I can't say that we are satisfied with the speed in which you know these 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 things are available um is or, or the, these ministers would make you know the kind of intervention for us you know we we are not really satisfied with the with the pace it, it, what it moves. but i would say that it's it's moving but not at the rate that we would want it to move. what kind of statistics are you aware of that we have of blind persons and the various age groups um, with a view to, in, to determining what kind of educational arrangements really you need to have. Is that, are those statistics available? No, I don't think it's available. I don't think it's available. And shouldn't it we, be? Isn't it the most elementary thing? Yes, it is. It is. What we use, we use um, the data from the census that they would have. Right? And that census tells us it's between five and 7,000 blind persons that you know, is in the length and breadth of Bayano. The problem is that most of those people are in the outlying areas of this country. And therefore, they're out of the reach exactly. of assistance. Yeah. We try, like, you know, there is organizations that, well, there's a council of organizations, because there's an organization that come out of that. But we try to link up with other organizations that might have blind people like in region 7 at Bartico, they have a couple of blind people there that would go to the um can't even remember the name of the organization it's a cross disability group mm -hmm. we have it in Essequibo um at Queenstown we have it at Linden and West Coast Bobies and over the river in Bobies region 6 mm -hmm. right and we try as much as possible at the society every so often to interact with those persons. We will go up, keep seminars, or we, when we have seminars in town, we will, you know, invite But, but there again, town. it's it's subject to availability of uh, funds. funds. You exactly. have to get there, you have yeah. to yeah. Yeah. subsistence um, accommodation. Yeah. 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 Do you think that you've got 7,000 persons um, that's quite that's quite a high, high number for a population of seven hundred fifty thousand persons. That's a that's a quite a, a, a significant number. Um, do you think we have allocated? Forget the the the, the measly two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's sufficient allocation of resources? Um, there's sufficient awareness, like maybe a blind awareness week or a blind awareness month. Is there any such thing? Next month is the month of the blind. We do extensive awareness programs in the month of May. Now, how... Just let me... Sure, go on. A um, couple of years ago, we came up with an idea where we used to call it um, a chain of canes. We used to surround yes, the parliament. Yes. Uh -huh. And we used to do that because we wanted to make people aware mm -hmm. that, you know, these are people that need uh, some attention, right? We need facilities. We need all kinds of things. How it, successful was that? I think the first year... It brought a lot of attention, and, and the, I think we did it for about three or four years, and it, it kept growing. But after a while, you know, we realized that, okay, fine, we have done this, and this can't go any further, right? So when we started meeting, and, and I must say over the last five years or so, we've been having extensive meetings with ministers of, of the government, and, you know, it... it 
probably because of that awareness campaign. You know, the ministers are much more at this time, or for the last five years, I would say they are much more attentive to what you say and they, they listen to you. And you know, I, I don't know, but for me, it 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 it's we're getting there, but you need something to push it, you know, a little a little faster. Do you think that the public services you you mentioned the the public transportation not particularly friendly um not do you friendly. think sorry not friendly not friendly not, not even not particularly <laughs> do you do you feel let's say you were to go into a government office the the passport office the guyana revenue authority um you're to go into the um city council office do you think these places are sufficiently aware and sympathetic and facilitative of persons with disabilities? Forget just blind persons. Yeah. Um, on a scale from one to ten, I would give them a three. That's and a that's, fail. Yeah? That's a fail. <laughs> I would give them a three because... If you look at the revenue, the the um, the license places in Cam Street, Ghana mm -hmm. Revenue Authority, right? It is not disabled friendly at all. For a person in a wheelchair, for a person on crutches, it's not friendly, and that's the beginning of it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the beginning of it. Um, the passport office you have some challenges there also. City Council, you have lots and lots of challenges. The bus park. The bus park is a mess. <laughs> and when rain falls, the whole city is a mess. You know? As a disabled person, right, it costs us more to live than any other body because them roads that got them holes on the pavement when you fall in there and your boots left and you gotta go and look for another boots and I'm talking about basic things that as a disabled person you need when you look at the money that government is giving to social assistance for people that that you know can't work and and them kind of thing right nine hundred nine thousand dollars that can't even last you a week when last you had a minister who visited the Blind Institute? Um, who was the last minister that visited? Was it Walter Lawrence? I think it was Walter Lawrence. Well, that's good. I think it was Walter Lawrence when she was at um, Social Security then. She was at... Um, Behind the fire station there. Okay, uh-huh. Right. We had a meeting with other ministers, but not at the Society for the Blind, right? Um, we had a meeting, it was last year, or year before, last year, I think, with the president as it, at, at um, the residence in Main Street. So we have been having meetings with different officials. As a matter of fact, I was get, I get a call from, from <coughs> Mr. Greenwich today, one of his secretary called to say that, he has a book that he wants to donate to the society, and he should be coming to the society tomorrow or the day after mm -hmm. to do that donation. Well, we like things like that because when he come, we can button only and show you everything that we want to show, you know. The, the, but the, for the, all of this, the government still only gives twenty thousand dollars a month. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I mean that's quite an insult. You see, I I don't know. What is the cause? Because we did write several years ago, and I think up to about a year or two ago, we did write giving a budget of a million dollars to them. Right? Um, that can't be a lot. No, it can't for, be. A lot. For a country of 300 billion, be. roughly. When you, talk about, when you talk about other organizations getting far more money than, than, than the society, you know, um, and this is why I think. We started the program of the school and we started it in a small way because 
we recognize asking for something to start to get this get money to start these programs is a hard thing so we we're just trying to get our foot in the door and you know move from there and but you've been around for 63 years yes. so that's a, you, you would have expected much much more of course and, of course. and given the, the huge numbers seven thousand yeah. persons yeah. it's quite a high number yeah well, the, 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 the census says that, you know, we have about 50-something uh, thousand persons with disability in the annual, mm -hmm. right? Um, and one of the things that I want to mention, and I always mention this to any minister or any official that I meet, is that I think a seat, for you to get a seat, you have to get about 6,000 votes. Yes. If we form a party, <laughs> we got a good chunk in, in, the, in, in, the, in the thing. You know, you know, forming political parties is not a good thing. I know it's not a good Politicians thing. Politicians are probably not, not, not high up on the scale of, of decent yeah. human beings. Well, well, we just want to get the message across that we are a consistency. Well, I hope you're getting the message across tonight. Yeah. Um, now, tell me something. If persons wanted to make a contribution to the Blind Institute, how can they do so? They could write a check to the Society for the Blind. Well, we mostly... And, and where do they find this place? How do they find this it? This is in High Street. Um, just as you pass Carnegie, yes. the Carnegie compound, there's an entrance, a uh, concrete strip going on there. Sometimes you don't think that nobody is behind there because it looks like a dump mm -hmm. because of the junkies throwing the rubbish and scattering it about there. But there is a entrance going down between that building and a building that the lot was the radio station, the previous radio station, yes. and they built a big concrete building that is there, that nothing is being a done. A monstrosity. With. Yes. Um, you come so down so there, yes, you persons, persons, want, persons yes. want to make a contribution. They could call the society. We will give them. And what's your telephone number? 226-4496. 226-4496. Those are the two numbers for the Society for the Blind. They could call. We will give them the what do you call account it, the numbers. Bank, the account numbers. They could put the money in the account, right? Or they could well, come. well, viewers. I hope you're you're listening, um, and you you've made a note. Two two six double four nine six two three one seven nine seven six. Those numbers are. Answer are uh, you answer them yeah. during the normal work day? No normal work day, and even beyond that. And you can call, get information, and make arrangements for donations. It's a most worthy cause. Now, I have some problems with the society, Mr. Morris. Yeah, you're the president of a society that hasn't had elections since 2006 that has not produced financial statements since 2005 whilst being very sensitive and of the your, the circumstances mm. this can be acceptable of course it can be acceptable man you agree with me you're taking yeah. everything out of me yeah <laughs> yeah you see mr ram the thing is this, that part of that time, we had some funding agency, international funding agencies, right? We had BCCP, um, this was a Canadian um, thing. We had about two other groups that we were working with. And we were advised at the time that, look, we are working with you guys, we know you guys. If you change right now, Right? We have to start this process over. Right? The last time when we had um, the program that was being run by the Basic Needs Trust, it's the same advice we got from them. Look. All right. Um, let, me tell, let me say this. I've just got a signal yeah. that um, we've got to wrap up. Yeah. I want you to make a final 30 seconds, final appeal for support from the public. Yeah, I want to and say, from the politicians. Yeah, I want to say to everybody that is listening in your shot of, of my voice is that we know that 
this thing is now right. We are working towards getting it straightened as fast as possible because it can't I go I was just speaking of elections. I was speaking yeah. of asking well, this, the public for assistance. Yeah. So the more assistance we get, the more things that we could put, you know, put in place, the faster we will get this thing up and running and, you know, running in the right way. So we are asking everybody to just, you know, bear with us and, you know, just continue giving us your donations and, you know, let us do some mighty works to the persons that are, you know, blind and, and make them much more marketable so that persons could go out, get jobs, get education, get jobs, get training so that you could do other All things right. and things like that. Mr. Morris, I want to thank you very much for appearing on Play Dog this evening. You have a very inspirational message, um, and I think it's a message not only for persons with disability, but for, for all persons that, and the message is, accept what you are, adapt to those circumstances, and move on. Definitely. Here is living proof of what that can result in. Operators and viewers, thank you. Good night. And I'll see you next week. Thank you.